very interesting topics so far for me at least. Um, obviously, it's called Leibniz versus Locke, not Leibniz's versus Locke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a version of a paper, this is the first ever paper I wrote in line, it's 23 years ago. Um, whether I understand what's going on yet, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I've been trying to make sense of this stuff, for, or some of it at least, for about 23 years. Um, it's a bit long, I've con condensed it as much as I can. I will, you've got a handout with loads of quotes on, I won't read all of those quotes, and I'm going to kind of whiz through it a bit. Um, and I'm sorry, I tried to condense it all, but it just, it wasn't as well. Um, so, Leibniz discusses the relationship between matter and mentality in two separate places in the new essays, which is commentary on law, basically. Uh, the first, which features his famous Mill argument, which many of you may know, is in the preface. The second is in book four, where Leibniz responds to the section of the essay, Locke's essay, in which Locke raises the issue of whether we could know whether any material being thinks or no. Leibniz's Mill argument is perhaps best understood as an attempt to show that matter conceived by advocates of the so called mechanical philosophy namely as passive extended stuff, cannot think through its natural powers. And this is something that Locke is actually happy to accept. Uh, he says at one point, matter is evidently in its own nature void of sense and thought. However, Locke considers two other scenarios in which we might, or he might, be willing to say that matter thinks. And that's what I'm interested in here, in Linus' response. Linus gives his own representation in the new essays. He, he's following a French translation by Pierre Cost, and he and messes with it a little bit, but he gives that basically in their response to it. Passage one is, is Phil stands for Philalethes, who is the voice of Locke, basically, and that's what Locke says, I and mean, it's pretty much what Locke says. I'm not going to go through it, I will pick out bits. Um, so the passage begins with a claim about knowledge. Locke tells us that we may never know whether something material might think. We're then going to have a reason for this. If we examine the ideas of thinking and matter that we have, unless the truth is revealed to us by God, we can't rule out the possibility of thinking matter. Or more precisely, that tells us that there are two scenarios whose possibility we can't rule out, each of which in his mind would suffice for there being a material being which thought, each of which are cases of what is commonly referred to in the literature as super edition. The first of these is one in which God has arranged that systems of matter fitly disposed have a power to perceive and think. The second is the hypothesis that God has created a world in which certain systems of matter are related to immaterial substances in such a way that they can be said to comprise thinking material things. In contrast to Locke, this is number two, Leibniz is confident that the question whether a purely material think being thinks on this or that can be answered, the square brackets are in uh, interpositions of Leibniz's into cost text, um, but that one doesn't make any huge difference. Observing, and this is what Leibniz says, I wish we could affect souls for their own good and cure bodies of their ills with an ease which matched the power, which I believe we have to settle this question. So that's one of the things that makes this fascinating. It's uh, Obviously it's not. Um, so the first section is to dealing with the first of these options. Why matter can't, uh, as I'm saying, think through divine enrichment? So it's not an addition of a, a new being, but something happens, God does something. So, number three, Leibniz turns briefly to the first of Locke's suggestions for how there might be a thinking matter in the preface, initially, observing that for God, to add a faculty of thinking to a machine, quote, the matter would have to be miraculously exalted in order to receive a power of which it's not naturally capable. Remember, Locke agrees with this, this natural capability claim. He doesn't want to say why in the preface, and he comes back to this in book four, and this is number four. Um, to maintain that God gives accidents which are not, quote, ways of being or modifications arising from substances is to have recourse to miracles and to what the scholastics used to call obediential power. It would involve a kind of supernatural elevating of things, as in the claim of some theologians that hellfire burns separated souls, which leaves open the question of whether it would be the fire which was acting rather than God acting in the place of the fire and producing the same effect. So there's lots going on there, lots of technical notions in the for one thing, Locke contrasts modifications with accidents. Uh, for Leibniz, the notion of an accident that he ascribes to the <coughs> scholastics is different from the notion of a modification in a crucial sense. Like modifications, um, accidents are inessential and for the most part temporary. Um, they're not necessarily temporary, but they are temporary. Features of the things that have them. But unlike modifications, they're not ways of being. Mode means way. Uh, and do not stand in the kind of intelligible relation to the natures of those things that this relation of being a mode seems to many people in the period, to Descartes as well, for example, to afford. 
For example, unlike the shape of an extended thing, the temperature of a person's body conceived as an accident, so the felt temperature, if you like, bears no intelligible relationship to the nature of humans as the scholastics conceive them, i.e. rational animals. Um, so there's a very different model of the intelligibility of accidents or modifications to the substances in which they're here. Um, another technical notion used here is that of an obediential power, which appears in order to flesh out the sense in which accidents would be miraculous. Leibniz explains how he understands this term toward the beginning of the roughly contemporary work, about six years later, the Theodicy, in which, um, in the context of a more general discussion of miracles, and this is number five. Thus, it's made clear that God can exempt creatures from the laws he has prescribed for them, and producing them that which their nature does not bear by performing a miracle. When they've risen to perfections and faculties noble in those whereto they can by their nature attain. The schoolmen call this faculty an obediential power. That's to say, a power which the thing acquires by obeying the command of him who can give that which the thing has not. We see from this passage that an obediential power is a power which goes beyond the nature of that which has it as a result of divine command. So returning to New Essays, page 379, so the big passage, um, we can see that the basic claim is that for God to give a faculty to thinking matter, um, yeah, sorry, for God to give a faculty for thinking to matter would be to impart a feature which went beyond its words. It would be a tribute, to attribute a feature that was not a mo or a limiting variation of matter as properly conceived. It's for, for, for precisely this kind of activity that Leibniz uses the term miraculous, so that kind of divine activity. Um, thus, Leibniz's claim that the coming into existence of thinking matter in this first way that Locke suggests would be miraculous is in the end really just another way of saying it would be the coming into existence of a feature attributed to matter that was not a modification of matter. Now, we might seem to have not really made much progress at this point. Um, we're still left without an explanation of why the need for miraculous activity in this sense is supposed to disqualify Locke's hypothesis. But there are other, other passages, and I think you can sort of see three ideas um, in these other passages, which are distinct from each other, though connected. Um, at page 381 of the New Essays, um, Leibniz explains what a world in which miraculous activity occurred would be like, as follows, this is number six. If God gave things accidental powers which were not rooted in their natures, and were therefore out of reach of reason in general, that would be a back door through which to readmit over occult qualities, which no mind can understand, along with inexplicable faculties, those little goblins, and whatever the idle school dreamed of. Helpful <coughs> goblins which come forward like gods on the stage, or like the fairies in their eyes. So do one demand anything a philosopher wants of them, without ways or means? So here the argument seems to be that if one allowed that the world might have aspects that were neither natures nor modifications of those natures, then there would be no way to block those philosophers who wish to introduce faculties at will when explaining patterns within observed phenomena. Making a similar point in the preface in connection with Locke's apparent willingness to allow that Newton's introduction of gravity into matter um, is possible despite the acknowledging that there isn't this kind of connection between gravity and the nature of matter, Leibniz suggests we may give, this is number seven, we may give too much leeway to bad philosophy, and more floridly, he quotes Ovid, everything will now happen whose possibility I used to deny. So what Leibniz seems to be suggesting here is that if we were to follow Locke, we'd be embarking on a path that reopens the possibility of a return to explanations of the kind that are famously lampooned in 1673 by Moliere, in his play, The Imagine the Invalid, which includes a group of physicians providing an explanation of the sleep-inducing properties of opium as stemming from its virtus wor domitida, so domitive virtue, we heard that trope before. Um, had Locke been in a position to take the opportunity to respond, I think he wouldn't have been moved by Leibniz's concern. But this reveals quite a radical difference between the two philosophers. I think. As we've seen, Locke and Leibniz agreed that matter as Locke conceived it, i.e. mechanical matter, as I sometimes call it in, in other papers, cannot think naturally. But whereas Leibniz sought to remedy this by giving a positive account of the metaphysical basis for conscious mental phenomena, such as sensory perception and conscious thinking, Leibniz's account of the mental, sorry, Locke's account of the mental remains at the level of the phenomenal manifestation of these features. Locke is not worried about the reintroduction of bad philosophy, because he's endorsing a conception of intelligibility that does not invoke the kind of explanation 
that would provide space for such entities in the natural course of things. If there were to be super addition for Locke, it would not be something that was intended to render intelligible the particular phenomenon of the co-location of thinking and given configurations of matter. Locke plugs the explanatory gap, not with a cause that's unique to the phenomenon in question, but with a general purpose cause, the divine will. And whilst, as we've seen, there might be more than one occasion on which Locke has attempted to invert something beyond the nature of matter to explain the presence of other features in bodies, namely gravity, it's always the same cause that's invoked. Thus, there's nothing in Locke's strategy that seems to open the floodgates to, to him at least um, for the reintroduction of proliferation of what Leibniz rejects, i.e. naturally, and this is the crucial thing, naturally occurring entities whose activity is treated as if it confers intelligibility, but which operate in ways that are inscrutable, and as inscrutable as the operation of the divine world. Um, and they're just multiplied wherever you get universals, essentially. Um, Lyman's second reason, so that's the first reason, the second reason to reject the invocation of divine activity in Locke's first sense relies on his understanding of the conception of divine activity that underlies Locke's suggestion. Um, so this is number eight. To attribute the, their, i.e. accidental powers, origin, to God's good pleasure, that appears hardly worthy of him, who is the supreme reason and with whom everything is orderly, everything is connected. This good pleasure would indeed be neither good nor pleasure if God's power did not perpetually run parallel to his wisdom. In other words, whilst God might have the power to produce worlds which were like the one Locke describes, and I think Lamis in some kind of very extended sense of the word possible does admit these as real possibilities, um, it would violate his wisdom in the sense that it would be causation without reason. So God would be causing, but he wouldn't be acting. There would be no choice. Uh, whilst I didn't develop the thought further at this point, we could imagine him relying on the principle of sufficient reason in ways that parallel his invoking the inadmissibility of absolute space and time in the correspondence with Clark, something you might be familiar with. For just as God would have no reason to create matter at one time or place in an infinite homogeneous container, it seems he would have no reason to create thinking in bodies that have one kind of material configuration rather than another. The presence of thinking in material systems that are human would be no more reasonable than the production of it in dogs, or indeed in inanimate things such as stones. If the fact that human beings think in contradistinction to other material systems is to be ascribed to divine activity in a way that Leibniz likes, there must be some intelligible foundation for this in the conception of human beings themselves. At this point, it would clearly be open to Locke to reject the principle of sufficient reason, and I suspect he would. Um, but I'm not going to perceive the debate that would ensue um, as a result of that. It would be similar to the Leibniz Clark correspondence in that way, I think. Um, I think Leibniz has very good reasons for pursuing the principle of sufficient reason. I think they're quite deep and profound, but I don't think they would have moved Locke either because he's a voluntarist, uh, a divine voluntarist. Um, instead, I want to go back to page 379, the, the, the kind of big response text, for another reason why Leibniz doesn't like this first superdition um, moved by Locke. Um, so, Leibniz finishes his discussion of the idea that God might act, and this is number nine, sorry. Leibniz finishes his discussion of the idea that God might act miraculously so as to bring about the burning of souls by hellfire. This is an allusion to the book of Daniel, I believe. Um, by noting that it, quote, leaves open the question of whether it would be the fire which was acting rather than God acting in the face of the fire and producing the same effect. Now, Leibniz is less explicit here than he might be. But it seems to me evidence of an additional worry for Locke's first hypothesis, namely that it would leave as an open question whether the thinking that occurred could be ascribed to the matter or whether it would be properly conceived of as God's thinking. So would it be a material being that was thinking? In the case of the fire, it's not clear that Leibniz wants to insist that the existence of this open question precludes the miracle. I mean, he has some miracles. Or he's willing to allow some miracles. They all happened in the past, they're revealed in the Bible, but for pragmatic reasons, he's not going to touch those, so that's my reading of that. Um, however, he doesn't, I think, like this in the case of thinking matter. Um, and look at number 10. Consider some of the things he says about thinking. I think this leads us, and it's very interesting, leads us to see why. Um, these are from passages written around, well, the first two around the same time, and the last one is later. Uh, but, but still, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's consistent. So the first one says, our experience teaches us, it seems to me, that we are in ourselves something particular which thinks and which wills. 
The second one says, we have experience of cells producing within themselves various internal actions. And the last one, the modifications we attribute to cells and which we sense in our own cell cannot be modifications of God. And as for the operations, again, we cannot deny our internal actions to ourselves. So what these passages suggest is that Leibniz thinks there is conscious cognitive activity, sorry, that where there is conscious cognitive activity taking place, it is something of which the cognizer is aware and in which the cognizer is aware of herself as the agent of change. Assuming that Leibniz regards this as constitutive for all conscious mental activity, which I think he does, um, this precludes even the possibility of a thinking machine whose thoughts were accidents sustained by divine activity rather than natural self-modification. So we're aware that we're not God, so that hypothesis doesn't work. Um, furthermore, these ideas appear in an interchange about ideas of power in the new essays itself. So this is, is number 11. Um, I won't read that to you, but that's yet further evidence that Ken would have made sense dialogically. He's picking up on things he thinks lots of to do. So in that, that's the, the, that interchange there, we see Leibniz agreeing with Locke that reflection furnishes us with our best idea of action. And crucially for present purposes, Leibniz asserts in a way that tracks Locke's own account, which is why I put that in, um, that reflection is nothing but attention to what is within us, and thus that we're aware of our mental activity. So the third worry could be stated in a slightly different form. Leibniz is concerned that Locke's hypothesis requires that God super add thinking alone to a body. But for Leibniz, the nature of thinking is revealed to involve the activity of the thinker. Setting aside, as both Locke and Leibniz were, the possibility that all thoughts are the thoughts of God, only on pain of contradiction, could God super add thought to a body without super adding a thinker. However, Locke offers this as a distinct hypothesis to which Leibniz offers distinct objections, and it's to those that are now returned. So the, the other hypothesis is God doesn't make matter think miraculously, as Leibniz would have it, but when matter has certain configurations, God sticks a thinking substance in there as well. And it's, that would be miraculous, but Linux has interestingly different reasons for rejecting this. So he, does, he could go for that line again, but he doesn't. Um, so number 12, according to Locke's second hypothesis, God might have produced a world with thinking matter if he, quote, joined and fixed the matter so disposed of thinking immaterial substance. I'm going to repeat myself now again. Given what we've seen above, one might expect that Leibniz's rejection of this hypothesis would proceed by showing that the addition of a thinking of material substance to Lockean matter would not lead to a situation in which the matter itself would think. However, the approach that Leibniz takes is rather different and perhaps surprising. His views are expressed in the following remarks, and I will read this. It should be borne in mind that matter, understood as a complete being, i.e. secondary matter in contrast with primary matter, prime matter, which is something passive and therefore incomplete, is nothing but an aggregate or the result of one, and that any real aggregate presupposes simple substances or real unities. So there's a metaphysical thesis. If one also bears in mind what constitutes the nature of those real entities, namely perception and its consequences, one is transported into another world, so to speak. That was the phrase that really kind of caught my imagination a long time ago. From having existed entirely among the phenomena of the senses, one comes to occupy the intelligible world of substances. And this knowledge of the inner nature of matter shows well enough what it's naturally capable of. And it shows that whenever God gives matter organs suitable for the expressing of reasoning, it will also be given an immaterial substance which reasons. This is because of that harmony, which is yet another consequence of the nature of substances. There cannot be matter without immaterial substances, i.e. without unities. That should put an end to the question of whether God is free or not to give immaterial substances to matter. And if the correspondences did not obtain among these substances, God will not be acting according to the natural order. So there's loads of stuff back in there. I'm going to try and draw some of it out. Um, what Leibniz says here is two parts. First, he's concerned to establish that a consideration of what he calls secondary matter shows that its existence presupposes that there are real unities. With this thesis in place, Leibniz goes on to argue that through consideration of the nature of these real unities, as, which is perception and its consequences, uh, we can come to see that God, on pain of violating the natural order, so that's back in there again, this kind of miraculousness is playing a role. God will always ensure that suitably configured matter will be accompanied by thinking substance. Now, there's a number of questions that arise if one tries to make sense of how these claims 
relate Alok's hypothesis and the sense in which Leibniz thinks he's, quote, put an end to the question of whether God is free or not to give the material substances to matter. Uh, I want to postpone those for now and focus instead on the claims that Leibniz made. So the first thing to notice is that Leibniz begins by contrasting prime matter with secondary matter. In the present context, though, puzzlingly, or, or, well, not puzzlingly, but annoyingly, perhaps, not in all contexts um, in which Leibniz writes, prime matter is purely passive mechanical matter, which has been the subject of all the considerations we've examined so far. It's that which Locke thinks matter is, it's that which, broadly speaking, Descartes thinks matter is. Pretty much everybody who's to whom mechanism appeals is thinking of matter in this way. Um, but here we learn that Leibniz thinks of this as something incomplete, as opposed to secondary matter, which is a complete being, or as he puts it on page 222 of the New Essays, matter as it actually occurs. And it's that which we're asked to turn our attention to if we're going to think properly about the second hypothesis. With our attention switched, we're given one of Leibniz's favorite arguments. Although he doesn't really draw out the conclusions very explicitly here, preferring to turn immediately to considerations that follow from it. And the argument can be represented as, as it is in number 14. Matter, a secondary matter here, is nothing but an aggregate or the result of one. Any real aggregate presupposes simple substances or real unities. Therefore, there are simple substances or real unities. I'm sticking in simple substance, but that is clearly in this context is equivalent. Um, this is a version of an argument, although there are important qualifications, that's prominent in Leibniz's writings at least as far back as the corresponding <coughs> down there in the late 1680s, so kind of 24 years prior to that. Um, if we're to understand it, we need to examine an assumption about the nature of matter that Leibniz is making and also consider the fact that a number of the terms are inevitably used in technical ways. The assumption about the nature of matter would have been commonplace at the time of the New Essays, namely that it is divisible in virtue of its being extended. Now, that has a whole bunch of potential pitfalls, as the, the way in which Cartesian matter is divisible is, is very puzzling. Um, anyway, but he's relying on that, and it's not clear anybody could have really denied it. I don't think Descartes would have denied it, but it, it's complicated. Um, most importantly, we need to understand what Leibniz says when he talks about matter being an aggregate. And kind of nothing up my sleeves, this is my reading of what aggregates are, and one could debate it, but as with all interpretations, when one gets to be a certain age, one can pretend that one is right without certain people <laughs> and then run with it. So that's what I'm doing here. And I think it's a defensible reading of aggregate and makes Leibniz really interesting in ways that other readings do. So that's those are my reasons for doing it. Uh, Leibniz's term aggregate is one that he uses, unsurprisingly, to refer to collections of things. However, it is a term of art and includes a number of features that are key for understanding this response to Locke. Aggregates are pluralities of things, i.e. the things that are aggregated, I'll call them aggregata um, occasionally, but they're not merely pluralities. They have a unity or a made whole by an act of mind on the basis of things they have in common, which is itself complex in that it requires an understanding of the ways in which the things aggregated are similar, which then forms the basis for conceiving them as one. And there's a further component that's crucial, namely that the identity of the minds which are responsible for aggregation, and here I have a disagreement with Donald Rutherford, but I'm, I'm actually convinced I'm wrong. Uh, the basis for this answer can be found in a letter to Arno of um, 1687 and other places. And here Leibniz says, the unity of these entities, i.e. aggregates, exists only in our mind. In other words, aggregates are at least the ones that concern human beings. Angels might aggregate as well. Uh, are wholes that are constructed by human minds and which exist as aggregates only in so far as they're conceived of as wholes. Um, I mean, Aggregates always exist only for finite beings, but there are finite beings other than human beings in Leibniz's ontology. So they could aggregate as well, but it would always be finite and the same general principle would hold. Aggregates exist only in so far as they are conceptions of pluralities as well. And the word aggregate does not refer to the plurality. It sometimes occasionally uses it that way, but that's not what he really means. Um, Mode of presentation is crucial. 
As we've seen, Leibniz argues for the claim that matter is an aggregate to the conclusion that there are simple substances or real unities. The details of this argument are just completely left out here. But they do appear in letters to Devolder that were written around the time Leibniz was composing the new essays and in other places. Here's a good example, the letter of 19th of November 1703. It's number 15. First, that which can be divided into many is constituted, i.e. aggregated from many. Second, things that are aggregated from many are not one thing except from a mind, and they have no reality except that which is borrowed, i.e. that is from the things from which they're aggregated. Therefore, third, things that can be divided into parts have no reality unless there are things in them that cannot be divided into parts. Indeed, they have no other reality, no reality other than that which is from the unities that are in them. It's clear from the context that, of this letter that the things he's talking about there are and can only be um, portions of secondary matter or bodies, those are the divisible things. Um, and Leibniz begins by observing that the divisibility of things into many entails that there are aggregates of many things as well. Next he observes that the unity of aggregates is a mental unity. As I mentioned above, Leibniz aggregates are mind independent in the sense that their composition depends essentially on the activity of creative minds. Such minds have the aggregality as objects of singular representations. That's crucial here, the singular representations that they have to be. have individual conditions which are independent of being conceived. Otherwise, they wouldn't be genuine singular representations. Um, in addition, they represent relations obtaining between the aggregata, which relations provide grounds for taking the aggregata to be a unified composed entity. And there's a kind of projectivism here, um, if you like, if you like that human term. Um, Leibniz concludes from this, one, that bodies borrow their reality from the things that are in them, the aggregata, and two, that this entails that they're ultimately aggregated from and have in them things that are indivisible or unities, the simple substances of New Esso's 378. Now, Leibniz uses the term reality here, which I think invites a little further elaboration. It must be used in a restricted way if the only reality that aggregates have is the reality they borrow or derive from the aggregata. Given the account of aggregates offered, it seems sort of natural to think that the reality of aggregates, aggregates is in part derived from the thing that does the aggregating. But this can't be the relevant notion of reality here. Aggregates are real in the sense under consideration only in virtue of having aggregata that are themselves real. So I think it's to kind of distinguish collecting together dream images, say, or something like that. They're real if they have real things which are gathered together. Aggregation is a, it's something that could occur with normal. Um, okay, um, so ultimately the reality of any given aggregate must be derived from <coughs> some aggregate with aggregata that are unities. So you can have aggregates and aggregates, but it has to bottom out. Those are the things whose unity is intrinsic, which are not themselves the product of aggregation, and hence, as he puts it in the letter of 19 November 1703, things that cannot be divided into parts, sorry, things that cannot be divided into parts. Leibniz's rejection of an infinite regress of reality borrowing is not argued for in the letter to the Volga or anywhere else that I'm aware of, really. Um, on the basis of what Leibniz says explicitly, the claim seems to be a group, though clearly challengeable ontological intuition. Uh, I think it's challengeable, I think he's got pragmatic reasons for constructing the ontology in the way that he does. That's my basic reading on Leibniz, but you could go for a different ontology. Um, you'd lose intelligibility of a certain there's perhaps more can be said here, but I'm going to return to Locke um, and the puzzles we started with. So there's no reason to think Locke would have been taken with this line of argumentation, I think, or Leibniz is insistent that composition of matter is mind independent. Sorry, mind dependent. However, as represented so far, the conclusion is when he probably would have accepted, assuming that he took Leibniz to be referring to atoms when he talked of simple substances. However, immediately after presenting the argument, Leibniz's discussion takes a turn that would have surprised Locke. So I'm suggesting Locke could have gone with the kind of aggregate thing, but would have thought there were physical unities, because he accepted naturally occurring atoms as the basic constituents of reality. But the next bit would have seemed weird. Because uh, Leibniz invites us to bear in mind that the nature of these unities consists in perception and its consequences. And Locke and atoms don't proceed. Again, Leibniz doesn't argue for this account of unities at this point, but this isn't so surprising, um, given that, again, there isn't really an argument for this. You've got to kind of, it's, it's really hard to get your handle on why they, they have to be mind-like things. Um, there's never a single argument. But Leibniz does have an argument that's supposed to support the view they couldn't be composed of Lockean matter, at least. And partly it is that sign of they can't be material 
and then we know that there is thinking, so he kind of puts those together in a certain kind of way. Um, the argument against them being material is number 60. Each extended mass can be considered as composed of two or a thousand others. There exists only an extension achieved through contiguity. Thus, one will never find a body of which it may be said that is truly one substance. It will always be an aggregate, won't it? Or rather, it will not be a real entity, since the parts making it up are subject to the same difficulty. And since one never arrives at any real entity, um, because entities are made up by aggregation, uh, sorry, let me try that sentence again. Or rather, it will not be a real entity, since the parts making it up are subject to the same difficulty. And since one never arrives at any real entity, because entities made up by aggregation have only as much reality as exists in their constituent parts. That looks like there's a word missing, but hopefully you have an idea. Um, sorry about that. The point's quite simple. Quite extended beings, masses of Cartesian or Lockyer, this is, I know it's a Cartesian, and so it's a Cartesian account of matter explicitly that's being attacked there, but it's the similar idea of passive extended divisible stuff. Um, it's indefinitely divisible, and for this very reason, its division can't give you the real unities that are supposed to be comprised of matter. Um, atoms of lock in matter could at best be simple in virtue of never actually having been subject to dissolution. They're not genuinely simple given that they're extended. So if you take the aggregate argument seriously, if you take the notion of aggregation seriously, you need simples which are not extended. Um, now, it might be natural to conclude that, to think that Leibniz's argument in the R no correspondence has as a corollary that the constituents of matter are unextended. Ultimately, I think it does, but there's been a lot of scholarly disagreement about just how that works, and some people say it's not the case. I, I think they're wrong, but I think they're wrong throughout Leibniz's career, but by the time we get to 1704, everybody seems to think he thinks that. So there is a literature out there, Dan Galber has made his life out of this literature. Um, but in the end, even Dan says by this stage it's known as a known moment, so only these simple and extended natural minded things. Um, so, those are the unextended mind like entities best known from the early parts of the monadology, and those are the things he's referring to at page 378 when he tells us that the nature of the real unities is comprised of perception and its consequences. I mean, so the idea is they're definitely are real unities. When you reflect on yourself, you find unity within yourself, you find various other, phenomenologically, you find various other features of yourself, so the identification of these is kind of waiting to be done, in a sense. Um, now, even granting the above, it remains somewhat unclear just how the fact that matter is aggregated from simple substances is supposed to fit with Leibniz's response to Locke's second hypothesis regarding thinking matter. And I still don't think I quite get this, but... Um, I'll see what I can do here. Um, I'm going to offer a sketch of what I think Leibniz is claiming in the remaining passage before thinking with, finishing with a consideration of what this tells us about Leibniz's views on whether matter might think. So this is 18. As we've seen at page 378, Leibniz claims if we bear in mind what constitutes the nature of those real entities, namely perception and its consequences, so we just have to kind of accept that now, we'll be transported into another world, so to speak. From having existed entirely among the phenomena of the senses, we come to occupy the intelligible world of substances. The knowledge we will then have of the inner nature of matter will show us two further things. One, what matter is naturally capable of, and two, whenever God gives matter organs suitable for expression of reasoning, it will also be given an immaterial substance which reasons. So, the first thing I want to draw attention to here is the way that Leibniz's metaphysical claims depend on a somewhat opaque claim that has epistemic significance. We're told that as a result of entertaining the concept of monads, we move from the sensible world to the intelligible world, and there I come to know, quote, the inner nature of matter. So here yeah, I just get a bit speculative still. Um, I think what Leibniz is suggesting here is that by entertaining the concept that captures the nature of the real unities that we know exist because of the aggregate thesis, right? we come to grasp that we ourselves fall under this concept. And, the experience, and that the experience we have of ourselves as perceivers is then regarded as revelatory of the intrinsic nature of that which appears to us ex as extended in sensory perception. One might say we're being encouraged to move from an encounter with a plurality of real entities as sensory phenomena 
to an encounter with one of them, namely ourselves as Nimina. With this encounter in place, we're shown, first that matter, it's interesting that that word is used, shown, uh, that matter is comprised of beings that are naturally capable of and continually have what I'll call cognitive states. For whilst it's true that some monads are never self-conscious and some don't have sensory awareness, monads are always active with constantly changing perceptions and appetitions, which are kind of quasi-psychological states. Um, just what kind of cognitive activity thinks there is in a typical chunk of matter remains unclear. There's lots of these things in there. But he seems to have been open to there being much more than meets the naked eye. Uh, indeed, he was very interested, interested in microscopy and often keen to point out that sophisticated animate beings are revealed in this way. So that what looks like it's just water under the microscope turns out to have living things in it. So some mentality, quasi mentality, is revealed in that way. The second thing we're shown in virtue of this transportation concerns the existence of thinking things in the sense that's been an issue in the discussion with Locke. Here the claim is that we will know that whenever God has created material systems which have the organic structure that would allow them to display reasoning, God will also have created a corresponding reasoning and material substance. Now the grounds for this thesis are again opaque. We're simply told this is because of that harmony which is yet another consequence of the nature of substances. Um, again, a bit speculative. I want to suggest that Leibniz expects us to use the experience that we have of ourselves as a key component of the support that this thesis receives. In experiencing ourselves as monads, we're also aware of ourselves as embodied in such a way that we can convey our rationality to those with whom we take ourselves to stand in spatio-temporal relations, at least other rational beings anyway. With this in mind, Leibniz's appeal to his thesis of pre-established harmony can be seen as something like a ground for analogical reasoning to the conclusion that acquaintance with similar systems of matter will be indicative of the existence of other minimal thinking cells. I actually don't think of it as inferential, I think it's more basic for him than that, more phenomenological, but you could think of it as analogical and inferential if you want to. Um, assuming this is something like what Leibniz has in mind, we can see how Leibniz might think it provides grounds for a response to Locke's second hypothesis, a funny one, namely that matter might think in virtue of the addition of thinking in material substances. Um, first, Leibniz thinks that the argument from the fact that matter is an aggregate establishes they can't be matter without immaterial substances. Second, consideration of the nature of these immaterial substances shows us that we are the kinds of entities, so we are entities of this kind that are endowed with reason and bodies with organs that allow us to express this. Finally, considerations of harmony show that if God did not ensure the existence of thinking immaterial substances in bodies that give the appearance of thinking, he would not be acting according to the natural order. Here the notion of what's natural is appearing again. Um, it is related to the previous sense in which it was invoked. Um, but um, the kind of miracle Leibniz has in mind is one that would require God to refrain from creating a harmonious world, namely one that included the rational substances required for it to be the case that matter, which comprises bodies that behave as if they belong to rational beings, actually belong to those beings. So number 19, recall that Locke had suggested that Locke might make matter think if he joined and fixed two matter so disposed a thinking immaterial substance. Leibniz's view on the nature of actual matter makes this untenable in a somewhat surprising way. First, there's a sense in which God is not free to add immaterial substances to matter, at least not in the sense that Locke has intended. For matter, as Leibniz conceives of it, is an aggregate of immaterial substances. There's nothing more to matter than any material substances represented in a certain way. Thus, God couldn't create actual matter without creating immaterial substances. But Leibniz also holds that the existence of the pre-established harmony entails that a portion of matter that gives the appearance of thinking will, albeit through a free choice of God, be attended by another immaterial substance, which is a member of the class of monads that aminds with thinking as an intrinsic feature. Thus, matter which is fitly disposed does not need the addition of an immaterial substance, since it will, barring miracles, already be attended by. So, I want to now finish with a few words about Leibniz and materialism. Now, this is just a, a page or so. Um, as we've seen, in contrast to Locke, Leibniz was confident that the question whether a purely material being thinks or no could be answered 
observing, I wish we could affect cells for their own good and cure bodies of their ills with an ease which matched the power, which I believe we have to settle this question. Uh, now, the complex discussion of uh, pages 378 to 81 and the parallel discussions in the preface really obviously don't spell out clearly and as neatly as it sounds like we're going to be uh, having spelled out how Leibniz wishes to answer this question. Um, I've offered an answer or some answers. Um, and we've seen that actual matter cannot become thinking matter through the divine addition of immaterial substances. For suitably disposed matter will, as a matter of natural course, already be accompanied by thinking things. But it's also the case that Leibniz has argued that the matter to which such a thinking thing accompanies is itself comprised of immaterial things whose natures are, for want of a better word, mental. So does Leibniz hold that matter thinks or no? Well, despite the complexity, um, I'm not going to suggest that he does think or matter thinks. Um, for in quoting from the essay, Locke's essay, Leibniz speaks of a purely material thing. And despite deviating slightly from Locke's own, Locke says, mere thinking thing, it seems to me that all Leibniz intends is to settle the question of whether matter could come to think in either of the two ways that Locke claimed. And it's clear that Leibniz thinks that no, that those hypotheses should be taken seriously. So he's not saying that he's a materialist, so that's not how he's settling the question. Now, that does still leave a kind of interesting question of what we might think about the relationship between matter and thinking on Leibniz's conception, given how we tend to think about materialism. Um, now, would Leibniz be a materialist if he were talking to us? It's difficult to say exactly what he might say. Um, I mean, we've seen that Leibniz holds that thinking things such as Leibniz himself have bodies that are aggregates of immaterial substances, which are themselves mental in nature. So whilst Leibniz does not hold that the bodies themselves can be said to think, there's something associated with these bodies, not different in kind from the things from which they're aggregates, that does the thinking. And bodies aren't real in any deep sense. Thus, while he would not want to say that when he himself thinks it is matter that is thinking, the body that Leibniz is partly constituted from is comprised of things which each have mental states in the broad sense. And so there is clearly a sense in which any piece of matter is something that has lots of mental activity taking place within it. So there's perhaps a sense in which thinking matter exists. But I don't think we should pay too much attention to this sense in the context of Leibniz's own writings. He himself appears to have been focused on a more well-defined question, namely whether matter, as conceived of by Locke and other philosophers of his time, including Cartesians, could be said to think. And here his answer is clear. Where materialism is a thesis about the capacity of extended, impenetrable stuff to think, it's a thesis that we should reject. Thank you.